Okay, welcome to the fourth in our series of update videos looking at indirect taxes. I'm going to spend a few minutes thinking about evaluation, uh, considering, for example, this question, what are the main justifications for a government or governments to intervene in a market using indirect taxes? Why might a government be justified in, in saying we need to change the market price to change the behaviour of both producers and consumers? Well, here are four key points. I mean, first of all, governments need to raise revenue to pay for their spending for defence, education, healthcare, social housing. And indirect taxes are a key source of tax revenue for the government. VAT is the third biggest, I think the third or sometimes the second biggest source of tax revenue for the UK, £134 billion a year. So there's a justification the government needs to raise the money to pay for public services and the welfare benefits and things, the welfare system that we uh, that we expect. The second key argument is that taxes can be used as an intervention in the market to change relative prices, to change incentives, to alter the behaviour of consumers and producers. A good example would be the sugar tax, perhaps, designed to try to reduce um, diabetes and some of the other health costs associated with con uh, consuming high sugar foods. Carbon taxes designed to stimulate the shift towards renewables. Essentially, you see what's happening. Indirect taxes are trying to change the pattern of demand for goods and services, to change the relative prices of X and Y and cause people to, to shift their demand. Now, linked with this, and this will be a series of lots of videos in, in the on the YouTube channel, is that taxes are justified as a way of helping to correct for one or more examples of market failure. Which is where the market, the price mechanism, fails to sufficiently uh, compensate for and adjust for, for example, the existence of externalities. Good example is the landfill tax to encourage recycling, uh, the sugar tax to combat, combat diabetes and so on. So most people associate indirect taxes with a way of combating market failure environmental taxes, for example, to make the polluter pay. At a macro level, indirect taxes are sometimes used to meet macroeconomic objectives. So governments might decide to bring into play protectionist policies such as an import duty designed to, to make imports relatively more expensive and to perhaps improve a country's net trade balance. Tax revenue is a really key part of the argument. So let's just quickly look at where you know, where a government can use indirect taxes to generate more revenue. In this diagram here, we've got a fairly price inelastic demand curve, and the tax has caused the price to go up from P1 to P2. The total tax is P2, P3. So there's quite a significant chunk of, of revenue. And there's a point to take away from this, which is the indirect taxes can actually generate a lot of tax receipts, especially if the demand for a good or service is relatively price inelastic, a low coefficient of elasticity of demand. So that yellow area is quite a big chunk of tax revenue. Think as an example of the duty on fuel, where there's you know, something like 60p per litre of a, of a litre of super and leaded diesel is tax. So when you're stood at the forecourt filling your car up with, uh, with petrol and diesel, you're also filling, your, filling the government's tax revenue coffers up at the same time. Interestingly, as, as we shift towards electric cars, the government may well lose quite a bit of that chunk of tax revenue. Now, the reason for showing you this diagram is let's just develop this diagram. Let's think about the change in tax. So if we increase the tax, the initial tax per unit is shown on that diagram. If we increase the tax, if we add on an extra tax, that can increase the revenue flow into the government. So the original tax was this yellow area whoops let's go back <laughs> the yellow area was the tax now we add more tax the price goes up to p5 the total tax is now p5 to p4 so we've increased the tax per unit and now the tax revenue is the green area and hopefully you can see that the green area is bigger than the original yellow area that's the original tax revenue that's the new tax revenue <clears throat> key point to take away from this Governments often favour products where demand is priced inelastic if they're looking to generate more revenue. It's a great analysis point to put in any of your assignments. 
If you tack something where demand is relatively elastic, and I've drawn this demand curve here as relatively price elastic, can you see the difference between this diagram and that one? Demand here is much more price elastic. Well, you're going to get some tax revenue, but actually, and there's the tax revenue shown there, but actually if you tax those products, you're going to get quite a big fall in quantity. So you're not going to get the tax revenue, although you might get the quantity change that you might want to justify on other grounds, social grounds, for example, environmental grounds. So there's often a trade-off for the government. On the one hand, they quite like these taxes, they bring in a lot of revenue, but on the other hand, you might have to impose a pretty hefty tax to have a significant effect on the on the quantity consumed. Well, a good example would be the, the sugar tax, the sugar drinks levy. Assess the arguments for the UK government introducing a tax on high sugar drinks. Many of these arguments, by the way, can be applied to a tax perhaps on, on high fat products or high salt goods and services, or goods obviously, or maybe a tax on plastic bottles. The government brought the sugar tax in. One of the main reasons was because of the external costs of, uh, of sugary drinks. That's a key, a key cause of, of market failure. The government brought in a, a tax on sugary drinks because they wanted to change the price, change the behaviour of consumers and producers, in part because of the externalities associated with uh, obesity and diabetes, but also because the, the, perception, the perception was that uh, people were over-consuming these drinks because they underestimated the long-term private cost of consumption. Uh, and of course, crucially, the sugar tax raises revenue, and of course, £140 million, I think, last year. And the initial aim, in fact, was the government was the government to take that revenue and use it for specific purposes. Whatever it is, funding improved nutrition in schools, funding primary school sports, what have you. Um, so that it's a revenue raising activity as well as a kind of argument for changing behaviour. The other, the other argument, the other justification used was that putting a tax on high sugar drinks would encourage producers, Fanta, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, etc., to reformulate their drinks to reduce the sugar content and thereby make them healthier for consumers. Arguments against is that the sugar tax is essentially regressive on lower income families, that households with relatively low incomes may spend a higher proportion of their income on these products and therefore they're getting taxed proportionately, disproportionately more. Uh, another argument is that in fact the tax may be ineffective, low elasticity of demand, there might be other policies better to change behaviour the smart behavioural nudges, for example, or tougher regulation at point of sale of drinks and high sugar foods. The other argument is that people might simply switch to other high sugar products. If they're taxing a high sugar drink, people might decide they'll just switch to high sugar snacks, for example, to get their sugar content. And there's a macroeconomic effect, of course, that if you tax the producers and the retailers, there could be a, a, lost, a loss of jobs in pubs and shops and things that, that rely heavily on drink sales for their revenues. What's interesting is what's actually happened in the UK. So this is the, the kind of early data on the sugar tax in the context of, of uh, the UK. Uh, don't forget the sugar tax is graded according to how much sugar there is per, um, per whatever, litre. And there has been a shift towards lower sugar drinks, as you can see, from 66 to um, 88%. And there's been a fall, quite a significant fall in the percentage of soft drink sales by volume that fit into the high tax bracket, which is taxed more heavily. One of the key issues that students, top students, always mention whenever they get a question on indirect taxes is the extent to which an indirect tax does impact on income inequality. In other words, is an indirect tax regressive? Well, a regressive tax is a tax which takes a higher percentage of somebody's income from those on low incomes. In other words, put slightly differently, those people on lower incomes pay more in tax relative to, perhaps as a percentage of their income. That's what we mean by a regressive tax. Now, are indirect taxes regressive in the UK? The evidence is that if you look at indirect taxes as a percentage of income, disposable income, and you think about VAT and duty on spirits, tobacco, fuel and other things, including gambling taxes, including the tax, for example, on the National Lottery, the evidence is that if you look at it as a percentage of income, indirect taxes 
are regressive in the sense that the bottom quintile, the poorest 20% of households, do pay a higher percentage of the disposable income in indirect taxes. And that figure, as you can see on this chart, goes down as we move towards the richer parts of the population. However, given that indirect taxes are essentially a tax on spending, some people argue we should focus instead on the extent to which uh, taxes are a percentage of household spending. And again, if you look at this data, indirect taxes, again, lumped together as a share of household spending, it shows that they're broadly speaking proportional between sort of 16 and 18 percent, broadly speaking. There isn't the, quite the same degree of regressivity. If I again go back a slide, that's as a share of income. That's as a share of spending. Share of income, share of spending. So indirect taxes, broadly speaking, are proportional. Although things like the tax on tobacco and the tax on lottery tickets are probably quite strongly regressive. So if we look at indirect taxes as a share of income, they're regressive as a share of spending, broadly proportional. OK, finally, quick review time. We covered quite a bit, hopefully, in the last four videos. Hopefully you've got a good feel for indirect taxes as a form of government intervention. Uh, quick review. Uh, here are six key revision points if you get questions on indirect taxes. Things just to think about as you go through your analysis and your evaluation. Six points to finish with. One, who pays the tax? So can the supplier pass on some, all of the tax to the consumer? That's one of the key characteristics of an indirect tax. Secondly, what impact does the tax have on the quantity bought? Again, that depends on the elasticity of demand as well as the, the length or the, the, the scale, the height of the tax. Thirdly, how much tax revenue does the government get? Governments tend to favour products with a low price elasticity of demand to maximise their tax revenue. Fourth really key point, how is the tax revenue used? Does it go into the general pot of tax? to fund all kinds of government spending, or is there a slightly more targeted approach where the revenue from one particular tax, for example, a carbon tax, might be used to fund renewable energy, or the tax from a sugar levy could be used to produce, to fund nutritional meals in school, for example. So how is the tax revenue used? Fifthly, what are the consequences for inequality? Is, a, is an indirect tax regressive or proportional in terms of its impact on different households. And finally, and importantly, those of you who have studied government failure already, which you will do at A-level, are, are there any unintended consequences of a new tax? So, for example, the, uh, the tax on uh, landfill brought about an increase in fly tipping as people just basically dumped their waste in fields, farmers' land in a, in a bid. To, to, to reduce the amount going into landfill. Sometimes if you bring a tax in, there's at least one unintended consequence. If you put high import duties on products, what is the, the impact on you know, tax avoidance, tax evasion through smuggling, smuggling, for example? So there are some key revision points to bear in mind. So we've covered in these four videos indirect taxes as a form of government intervention. And I hope you found the four videos together uh, a useful aid to your studies. Take care and uh, see you all soon.